tonight. Our guest is um, Lika Devada, and she is a real estate entrepreneur, developer. She is a um, mother. She is a host of the wildly successful real estate at work in Seattle, but it was also on um, virtual. And now she's fully in person. And um, I want to say thank you tonight, Lika, for coming on. She's going to be talking about sharing her experience, strength, and hope about real estate and working in a male-dominated arena. So, Lika, thank you for coming on again. Appreciate you. And the floor is yours. Oh, thank you, Lawrence. Thank you guys for having me. It's actually really cool how you did this. Um, so it just gives me a little bit of a connection with everyone that's over here. And I kind of understand where they are and, you know, what they probably need from me. But um, I don't have a presentation. I'm going to just talk. If you guys have questions, I just want this to be as interactive as possible because I want to give you as much value as I can possibly give you. So Feel free to unmute yourselves or put your question in the chat and I'm happy to answer that. Um, if you do have video and you wanna come, I love seeing pretty faces on the screen. So um, do that. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you, Trevor. Um, so yeah, I would love to get started. My name is Lega and I moved to the US in 2006. Um, I was born and raised in India. And I uh, moved here because I, I met the man of my dreams and he lived here. And so that's what brought me to the U.S. And I've always lived in Seattle. I worked at, I had a W-2 for a long time, eight years um, at Nordstrom Corporate, where I was a uh, brand merchandise manager for. Um, Do you suck dick on demand? Yes or no? Do you obey? This dude's out there every day fucking working. I was like, what? <laughs> um, yeah, so I basically, you know, I've been here um, close to 16 years. And in 2014, I was like, okay, I've got to go and work for myself and do something that is, you know, gives me time freedom and financial freedom. And that's when I started learning and just like researching about real estate um, and started investing back in 2014. It has been almost 10 years. Today, I own a uh, rental portfolio in downtown, in the greater Seattle area of about 40 units. I'm part of a $30 million syndication. I do multifamily syndications, buy commercial office buildings, and do single family flips. Um, now, when I first started, I'd, I had no idea what I wanted to do. Like, I didn't know if I, if, you know, what was right for me, whether it was rental properties, whether it was multifamily syndications, like what was right for me. And at that point I was like, like Jeremy, I had no money of my own. So I took a HELOC on our house and that was basically my working capital. That's what I used to start my business. Um, and so with my HELOC, I was able to do one deal. <laughs> I was like, it's like, you know, um, it's like, big time or bus time, right? So I did the one deal and it didn't make me any profit. I in fact lost $5,000, but because that was all the money I had, I could have made a huge loss on that first uh, project. And instead I made it a super small loss. Um, so I gave it my everything. Like I went to the job site every day. It was a single family flip. Um, and pretty much, you know, brought it home. So I did that whole project from start to finish to understand what is, you know, goes into the making of a deal. Um, how do you underwrite single family flips? How do you buy them? How do you reconstruct them? How do you market them? And how do you sell them? Um, so then from there, with a little bit more knowledge and understanding of, you know, what I wanted to do in the market and, and just that asset class, I was able to scale. And so the next year I did like eight flips. And then the year after that, I did 12 flips. And then I started to do fewer flips, but more quality. So every flip that I did was over a six figure profit. Um, and I was like, okay, that's the only way I'm going to do this. Cause I don't want to make those 
40, 50K profits anymore because it's just not worth my time. I'm only going to do it if it's 100K plus. Um, and that led to me buying some crazy deals and doing some crazy uh, transactions. I once subdivided a lot. Um, I took one single family flip and instead of flipping it, I bought it as a single family flip. And instead of flipping this house, what I did was I held on to the house and I subdivided the lot into three parcels um, and ended up selling it for a million dollar profit. Then what I did was I was like, oh, you know, if I could go back and redo this all over again, what I would do is start owning a rental portfolio because I'm constantly in this hamster wheel of let's go buy property, let's fix it up, let's flip it and then take all that profit, put it in the second property and then take all that profit, put it like now buy three deals, right? So I was like, no, that's got to stop. So every time I made some profit, I would go buy a rental property and start making passive income. And that's how I was able to scale to 40 units in a hot, hot market and an appreciating market like Seattle. Um, so that led me basically to do some other crazy things like, um, you know, just like getting really creative with exit strategies, because I think if you can maximize potential on every deal, that's what's going to grow your net worth um, more than anything else. Um, so what I started to do was I would buy like a single family house and then I would put a 14, 1500 square foot addition on it. Um, and that was just a crazy learning experience because anytime you're putting a new structure on an existing structure, it's going to have leaks. It's going to have foundation cracks. It's going to have roof leaks. Right. So then how do I figure that out? Right. So that's, I, I really studied the process and now it's become one of the best things I can do for my investment properties. Um, that also led me into just looking at adding income generating units, like, you know, maybe converting the downstairs into an accessory dwelling unit, um, maybe adding a dadu, maybe doing, you know, like just the, the one strategy that works for me over and over again is, I don't know if you guys have heard of it, but it's the Burr strategy and you can use it on single family, multifamily, large apartment buildings, but it is such a proven, true, tested strategy for me. Um, like, I'll give you an example. I bought a fourplex in um, a pretty hot neighborhood in Seattle, in the South, um, and I bought it for 625 I renovated it for 185k and it appraised for 1.25. 1.25. Today, the bank, when I refinanced it, the bank paid me 50k to hold on to this property because I did a cash out refinance and the property cash flows 3500 a month. And I have long term debt on it, so it doesn't matter what happens to the interest rate. I have long-term 30-year fixed debt. Um, and so I'm going to continue to cash flow on this property. And that is how I started to scale from single family to multifamily. I started small. I started with a triplex, then added on, made it a fourplex, then a fiveplex, then an apartment building, then a really large apartment building, and then an, a vacant office building. Um, so it's just been really cool to, you know, transition from just doing single family flips to today. Now, the one thing that I love to do, and the one thing that I'm really good at doing is single family flips. So this year, everyone knows what's happening with the interest rates. Everyone knows what a crazy market this has been. I still renovated my flips absolutely to the best of my ability. Like I designed them. I uh, create amazing, meaningful floor plans. And the first flip that I, I, I was going to list it for a million 150. And the last week I told my listing broker, I was like, let's list it for a million three and see what happens. We can always drop the price. Within five days, we were under contract for 1.25. And I was like, hell yeah, that's a win. I'm taking it. My last flip was went on the market last Thursday. Um, and the brokerage said, oh, you know, let's list it for just under a million. And I was like, why? You know, I know my product. I know my competition. Let's go 1.1. 1. 1. 
three days, we were under contract, full asking price, 1.1. Um, and so like, even in this market, if you're able to deliver above market quality for under market price, your assets are going to sell. If that's your strategy is short-term fix and flips or um, short-term investments, where if, even if it's a cosmetic deal. Um, so I'm going to stop for a second. Do you guys have any questions? I do. When yeah. you were scaling from the triplex to the fourplex, were you 1031 exchanging those or yes. selling them? Great question. So when I was scaling, I would, yes, um, I've done like three large 1031s um, of my portfolio and they've all been amazing properties that I've exchanged into. Um, the first was a triplex, um, which I have converted into a fiveplex. And it has killer views of Seattle. Um, it was listed on the market for 1.4. We got it under contract and then we did our inspection and we knocked the price down to 1.2. So got a great deal on this. Um, I was 1031ing from a small a condo that I owned. Um, and like that condo was bought for 275 uh, a while ago and it was used to be my primary residence. And then I moved and so it became an investment property. But that condo barely had anything left on the mortgage. So when we 1031, when we sold it, I sold it for 550. And so I took all that money and put it into this triplex in a very, very gentrified area of Seattle. Now that triplex, which is converted into a fiveplex, um, which I bought for 1.2 is worth 2.2 because I bought it back in 2020. Now, another 1031 that I did was I, like I said, I sold off those lots, made a lot, lot of profit. I ended up buying an office building in downtown Seattle and what's cool about this building is it was super distressed. And I was like, okay, I'm going to have to renovate it. But the location, and it was vacant. So like, I don't even know how I found a lender to lend on this property because I was buying a vacant office building in the middle of COVID where no one was going to office. Um, but I did end up finding a lender and uh, we did end up buying this building. What's cool about this building is this. It is right next to the Facebook headquarters in Seattle. It is also on the same street as Apple, Amazon, and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. It is one of the hottest streets in Seattle. And I was just like, I got so lucky because I bought this property for 1.95 million and it was completely distressed. And when the bank appraised it, they, th their value came back at 2.4. So they were actually like, wait, was this an arm's length transaction? Because this is like such a good deal on this building. Um, and so then I started the renovation and I, what I thought was going to be 150K reno ended up being a $400,000 reno because it's a large 7,000 square foot building. It's got five floors and um, it just ended up costing a lot more. But the good news is that now that things are getting leased out, we're, we already have, it's got seven units and we have leased out four. So there's two remaining, but there's one like super large unit that has splendid views off the lake, which I am converting to an event space. And uh, like Lauren said, I do host my in-person meetups and my meetups have been at that event space. And it's been really cool to see that um, this is the like a real estate meetup that I'm hosting in my building in downtown Seattle. So that's been really cool. And it was all because of my 1031 exchanges. I have a, I have a question for you, Lika. Mm -hmm. When you were scaling, what, what, why did you, what made you pivot to, to what, what made you want to, why did you change your mind from residential to commercial? Yeah. Um, because more doors, less risk. Um, and also what would happen is people, so I'm also a real estate broker. So people in my brokerage would get wind of these multifamily buildings and they don't know multifamily at all. So then they would all come to me. They're like, you buy crazy distressed property. You're the only one that knows what to do with it. So would you like this fourplex? I'm like, yes, I would love that fourplex. 
I would love that triplex. I would love that duplex. I will take it all. So then I just became known for buying multifamily. And so it just so happened that I was in the right place. And then I just started to find these cool multifamily that I would buy. And I knew what to do with it because I understood construction and reconstruction. It's super hard to buy distressed multifamily. It is also one of the easiest ways to maximize and increase your equity. But it is so hard to do, to remodel these buildings because like if you opened up one plumbing stack, that's connected to the whole building. And suddenly what should have been like a $5,000 expense is now a $50,000 expense. So like, how do you mitigate that? Um, so that's just another beast that you have to overcome. One, one more question. Where do you get, all, I understand I understand that you were, you were flipping properties, but where did you, you get those knowledge from? I did not, when I first started fixing up a house, my first house, I didn't know that drywall and sheetrock were the same thing. I had zero idea. I didn't come from a construction background. I didn't have like any kind of construction knowledge. So what I did was, and I didn't know, like this was a question, I no joke. This is a question I asked my contractor. So I walked in the into the house one day and I was so mad. I was like, why is the drywall not up? Why is the insulation not up? He's like, uh, because we just got done with framing and the electrical plumbing's not done. And I was like, oh, I see. So that comes before the insulation and the drywall. I get it now. I was so green. So what I did was I started going to the project every single day. And by the time I was on project three or four, it started to click. Like, oh, I see you start with the demolition and the trash out. Then you do the framing. Then comes the plumbing, electrical, and HVAC. Then insulation and then drywall and then texture and then paint and cabinets and tile and trim and doors and floors and trim. Electrical and plumbing trim and then your house is ready and then landscaping. Like, I get it now. So that was a process that, that I had to learn. <laughs> Um, and it it wasn't overnight, that's for sure. <laughs> but I have been doing this for nine years now. So now I know a thing or two about it. Um, but anyway, along the along the the my journey, I have met some amazing people. I co-authored a book called The Only Woman in the Room. I'm gonna talk about that. I do have my own lending program, it's called Loans by Leka. And I um, host an amazing meetup and um, and I'm just like really lucky. I was telling Lawrence that I'm going to MC Bigger Pockets Conference 2023, which is like super exciting for me. So from hating public speaking to actually being on these large stages has taught me so much about myself and about how you just like one has to continue to push boundaries um, and then like take over these opportunities. Um, so I know Lawrence wanted to talk, wanted me to talk about just being a woman in a man dominated space. Um, and I want to touch on that really quick. I have had nothing but amazing experiences from the men that I've worked with. Um, and I say this with just like so much love for all the men that I have worked with, um, whether it is finding deals or partnering with people on deals or working with my contractors, I just feel like everyone has, you know, tr treats me with respect, treats me as an equal. They're not like, oh, she's a girl, like she wouldn't know how to fix up this deal or she she wouldn't buy this apartment building or she wouldn't know how to work out this exit strategy. It's never been that way. I feel like they've definitely, you know, walked me through stuff if I needed to be walked through it. Um given me the same opportunity they would give to any guy. So that's been just amazing to, to watch and just be really thankful for the community that we're in because I know that it can be really hard. I have friends in tech that, you know, it's not the same. Um, so I'm just really, really proud of our community, I want to say. So yes, that's the book. Yes, I have it right there. Um, so I did co-author a book called The Only Woman in the Room, and it's uh, co-authored by, I want to say, 20 women, and each of us wrote a chapter. 
And it's just our experience of being in this industry and um, how it's either worked in our advantage or not. So it's really cool, different stories from different women. Um, some women have had horrendous life experiences just from you know, being in abusive relationships or moving countries or um, you know, dealing with not very honest people along their journey. So it's a really cool book to read because each of us came with different experiences and different thought processes. We each in, you know, invest so, so differently. Um, and it's cool to kind of see like, you know, what strategies work. The one thing that I will say about real estate is the coolest thing is that you create your own roadmap. Like what works for me may not work for Jeremy, may not work for Nancy, but what works for them may not work for me. So it's like, what, where do you live? What do you have access to? And then what do you have that hunger and that drive for? I think that's what motivates each of us. And Honestly, the world is your oyster when it comes to investing in real estate because I can't think of another industry where you could just go in and be like, oh, today I feel like buying a single family. Today I feel like buying a multifamily. Today I feel like emceeing a conference or writing a book. Like those are just amazing opportunities that are just available to everyone. So it's like, you know, what, how much can you maximize out of this industry? Uh, it's all up for grabs. Any other questions? Yeah, hi, Leica. I had a question. Hi. Yeah. Um, so were you in real estate prior to starting, you know, investing? I think you said nine years ago. And I'm just wondering what what do you think were some of your um, I don't know, competitive advantages or things that really helped you were your deals off market? Was it having really good contractors um, that you're able to get some of the big wins? And then what are some lessons learned from things that did not go well? I love that question so much. Um, no, I was not in real estate when I started. I worked for Nordstrom Corporate and I was in brand merchandise strategy. So I had nothing, no, no knowledge on. I, I actually thought as women, the only real estate you could be exposed to is being a broker, um, either showing homes or selling homes. Like I didn't know that women could invest in real estate or younger people, men and women could invest in real estate. I thought it was something that only like, you know, much wiser, wealthier men would do. So like for just, you know, being exposed to like, hey, anyone can do this was a huge win. So I was actually, I was on this. So I had just had a baby and I was working super hard at my W2. And I was like, what can I jump into? That's going to give me the time freedom that I need. At that time, it wasn't even financial freedom. It was what it, what's going to give me back my time? What's going to let me work on the whatever time that I, I wanted to work or put into uh, creating wealth? And so I was literally driving to work one day and I heard a radio ad for a real estate investing company. Uh, it was from Fortune Builders and they were talking about how you can buy a house and you can flip a house. And I was like, what is that? So then I went into their, they had a uh, like a, a mastermind, they called it. So it was like a one hour mastermind where they would show you a lot of the tricks. So I attended that and I could only do 30 minutes because I had to go back to work. So I attended 30 minutes of that and I was just hooked. Like I was blown away. And then they were offering a three-day course and I was like, yeah, I'm in. So I ended up doing the three-day course and that's when I really got all that knowledge about like, okay, you can buy a house, you can fix it up. And so I grew up in India, you guys, you don't fix up houses in India. You just tear them down and you rebuild. There's no flipping homes in India. So it was a really new concept for me. Plus I was like, okay, how am I going to find the deals? Who's going to finance them? Like, I don't even know how to get started. So when you talk about pitfalls, every brick of that, like there was no social media, there was no Zoom calls, there was no meetups, there was no Facebook, um, there were no groups, there was no, you know, like little real estate investor meetups or gatherings or whatever. So like, I just basically had to figure it out. So my pitfalls were, okay, how do I even get started? I don't know. Um, and then I just so happened to 
one day run into a friend of mine who was in an escrow company. And I was like, hey, this is what I want to do. Like, do you know anyone in real estate? And he was like, oh, yeah, you know, a guy that I know, he renovates homes. He's a GC. So then I spoke to him and that guy introduced me to his broker who finds off-market deals. And then that broker introduced me to his brokerage, which just so happened to be like a pretty large deal finding machine here in Seattle. And they were the ones that bought, brought me my first deal. Never went back to them because it was such a shitty deal. They told me that the rehab was 60K. It ended up being 120K. And I was like, oh my Lord, like this could be a pretty brutal industry. Like people are just going to tell you whatever you want to hear to sell you a deal, right? So like talk about pitfalls. Like those are things I didn't know. Um, then I, I do feel like this is a very people driven industry. You need to have great relationships with everybody you meet with, either it's your broker or your general contractor or your escrow company or your lending company. So once I figured that out, I was like, okay, who are the people that I need to surround myself with? Chris. Chris. <laughs> um, what do you do, Chris? Okay, he'll come back. But like, you know, who are the people that you surround yourself with um, that are going to take you to that next level? And so that's how I started finding my tribe. Now, when it came to contractors, oh my God, the mistakes I made. Um, I went through, I want to say 20 contractors before I found my one amazing contractor that I ended up working with for about 15 projects. Um, and then, oh, no worries. <laughs> um so then, um, then I found my next contractor who I've basically done about 30 projects with that he and I are like two peas in a pod. Like I found my vibe with him. I found my tribe with him. And honestly, a contractor can make or break you in this, in this industry. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so, you know, it was really super important for me to like lay out that team. Um, I also ended up finding this amazing company that they what they do is they door knock pro for properties, both multifamily and residential and commercial. Actually, they door knock, they find off market deals. And I became such a good client of theirs that now when they find an incredible deal, the first thing they do is call me before they blast it out. They call me because I've done about 35 deals with them, with this company. Um, so the other thing is like, you know, I mean, have I lost money on deals? A hundred percent. Like if you ever meet a real estate in investor that has been investing in real estate for as long as I have, and they say that they've never lost money on a deal, run in the opposite direction because it is not true. Um, you are definitely bound to lose your shirt on a deal or two, but it's just about not over leveraging yourself that can save your butt, especially right now when things are so up and down. Like, you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. It could be a bank meltdown. It could be um, interest rate locks. It could be whatever it is. Like, it could be bank stop financing investment properties, whatever it is. Um, you just have to not be so over leveraged that if something were to go wrong, you can backstop that. Um, so, like, on deal number 37, I lost 67 grand. 67 grand on a tiny flip that I was doing. And it's because right when we were ready to go on market, like, okay, a lot of things happened. Um, first, it was a 900 square foot house and the city that we were doing it was so rigid that they did 37 inspections for permits. 37 inspections on a 900 square foot house. Never had that happen before, but it happened. So did that put us over budget? Yes. Next. When we went to list the house, Amazon announced, so you know, I'm in Seattle. We are driven by tech. Uh, we are driven by Microsoft, Amazon, and then all the other ones, Facebook, Google, Apple, whatever, like the smaller companies. But Amazon said, we're going to now introduce a head tax, which means, uh, or the state said that they were gonna introduce a head, ta head tax on the large corporations which means that if Amazon was hiring an employee, they would have to pay twice the amount of tax um, just to own that business in the greater Seattle area. 
And because of that, what Amazon did was they said, screw Seattle, we're going to go somewhere else. So they, while they still had a presence in Seattle, they started looking across the country, Austin, Virginia, um, different, different parts of the country. They had like 45 cities identified and they were like, we're going to just open our second head HQ in one of these. That basically stalled Seattle real estate because a lot of Amazon employees stopped buying. And what they would do instead was say, okay, you know what? If Amazon moves to Austin, I'm going to move to Austin because it's a much better uh, city for cost of living. Um, I don't have to pay these high you know, taxes. I don't have to buy these expensive homes. Uh, and I can have a great life because Amazon's still going to pay me the same amount to live in Austin and have a better work-life uh, situation. And so as I went to list this property on the market, people stopped buying real estate. So it was like a switch, like overnight people stopped buying. So the property sat on the market for three months and we weren't able to sell it and finally sold it at a $67,000 loss. Uh, but that was shielded by two flips that I'd done before where I'd made like 150 k in profit. Um, and then deals that I did after that made quite a bit of profit. So um, Bethel, I hope that explains it. Like I've had some massive pitfalls and you know, this journey is not smooth at all by any means. Um, even today, like we don't know what's going to happen with financing. You know, I have like a short term uh, bridge loan on one of my apartment buildings, which is going to be have to be refinanced next year. And I'm like, I don't know who's going to refinance it. Maybe we just have to sell it. So as long as you have a plan B, C and D, you should be OK. Thank you for the answer, Lika. Thank you. Yeah. Lauren? So, yes. Mm -hmm. I have a question for you. Yeah. You talk about pushing boundaries. You talk about going, going for it all, right? What do you do? Because, you know, pushing boundaries. What happens when, you know, people have a lot of times, a lot of times people have analysis paralysis, right? What takes you, oh. out of, what takes you in pushing your boundaries and that's, can you outside of that analysis paralysis? Uh, analysis paralysis is one thing that I never did. I was like, okay, does this work or does this not? Because I just had so much else going on that I'm like, okay, if I just like sit on this one thing for one for too long, then I'm I'm just gonna lose my myself in this, right? So whether it's deal underwriting or it's switching to a different asset class. Um, I've always not said, okay, I'm only going to stick to one location or to one asset class or asset type. Um, I've always said, I'm going to go where the deal takes me, but I know my boundaries and my boundaries is my tri-county area. I'm going to stay where I am because this is where I'm boots on the ground. This is where my team is. Um, so within that, any asset class, any any project, any kind of project, small or big, I'm happy to dive into as long as the numbers work. So no analysis paralysis, either the numbers work or they don't. You just either do it or you move on. I hear you, Lika, I hear you, I hear you. <laughs> so now, we're almost at that point of the meeting. So let me ask you a question. There's, there's some people here who said they're just getting started, right? Yeah. What advice would you give to somebody who's just getting started Somebody's like Jeremy who says, you know, I took the, the, the HELOC. I'm doing a few things. I'm going to do some more things. I'm going to scale up. I'm going to be like Lika, right? Mm -hmm. I'm going to make that move, you know? I want to make that move. What advice you give somebody who's starting out? So it's like, let's say not, not brand new, right? But somebody who's just like, they got their foot, they're, they're testing, their, their foot, they're up their kneecaps. Yeah, yeah, got it. Um, yeah, I was there not too long ago. And I think the most important thing that you'll do is network. Go to your local meetups. You know, if there are no local meetups, then start one. Um, as a meetup host, like, oh my God, the deals that you see, the people that want to connect with you, like every meetup that I host, the following day, I have like 17 emails in my inbox saying, hey, I have this deal or can you connect me with this person? Like just be a master connector because that'll come back to you in spades. Um, if you want to scale, you're not going to be able to do that using your own money. You have to start raising other people's money. You have to bring in partners like, you know, Trevor Thompson is just such an OG at raising capital. 
you know, just set up a, a 30 minute Zoom call with him and be like, Trevor, how do I raise money? You know, what what do, what are some of the things that I have to look for? What kind of deals are attractive to people that have money? Um, and then, you know, just start to scale and then start surrounding yourself with the people that you want to be like. Um, when I started flipping homes, I was doing like two homes every six months. I wanted to be like someone that was doing 15 homes a month. And so I, I started networking with them and I was like, soon enough, I was doing six homes um, every six months. And I was like, wow, this is amazing. Like I scale pretty quickly. And I did that by using other people's money and by networking for deals. Um, and then constantly interviewing and testing out different contractors. So if you want to scale, like it's all there, it's within your reach. Um, just go, go network, go find the people that can get you there. Bhakti, I know that you want to scale in Seattle. I'm hosting a meetup tomorrow night. Um, it's in downtown Seattle. So come to that because I have not seen more deals being made right in front of my eyes than at that meetup. So I thank you. Yeah, it's definitely on my calendar. Um, and I'm so so glad you're talking about now versus like eight or nine years ago because I'm really curious just piggybacking off of what you're saying and what Lawrence the question Lawrence asked is it similar or different or like we've had a lot of growth in Seattle over the last few years and now it's sort of like going down a little bit like the, the home prices are going down but I guess what are you expecting especially for somebody who's maybe looking to make their first deal um, yeah, um, I would say that it is a tricky, tricky market because buyers have gotten super picky just because they can, uh, because not everybody is writing like there were times when I would put a really bad house on the market and I would get 30 offers on it. Um, right. So the market kind of saved me. Uh, I don't think the market's going to save you today. You know, even for me as a seasoned investor, the market's not saving me. If I put a bad house on the market, the market's like, screw you. That's a bad house. No one's buying it, right? So you, the best thing you can do is find someone in your market that is constantly doing deals. Either they're buying multifamily or they're flipping homes or they're doing apartment syndications, like whatever it is that you want to go into, find those people and start being mentored by them. And the way to be mentored by them is first by adding value. How can you add value? Hey, I have capital hey, I'm going to go look for off-market deals and I'll bring you a deal, right? When I first asked to be mentored by someone, she was like, do you have a deal? I was like, no. She's like, well, I find a deal and I'll partner with you. And I was like, if I'm finding the deal, why do you, I need you to partner with me? Because she brings the experience of being a seasoned investor, right? So um, there's so many things that can go wrong, but by partnering with someone more seasoned, they can basically give you their playbook. Hey, don't do this or don't put that tile or, you know, don't go to that lender or whatever it is. Like you're going to get like a wealth of knowledge and experience from that person. So find those people and start networking with them. I would say thank you very much. I respect your time. <laughs>